let me welcome everyone to this session of property based testing and examples of properties from business applications by Saurabh Danda we are glad they can join us today so without further delay over to you Saurabh hey thanks devesh hi folks uh, my name is Saurabh i run this company called vacation labs we are based out of goa where it's still raining like crazy um so i am an engineer and at heart i have built large scale systems in many tech stacks rails angular java but lately i've been having a love affair with haskell and uh, i'm also trying to make learning haskell simpler in this passion project that i've started haskelltutorials.com and you know with all of this love affair of haskell is when i where i discovered property based testing right uh, so i heard uh, about property based testing at functional conf in 2016 last year uh, i gave a similar talk version 1 of this talk that i'm about to give right now um i gave that last year uh, but that was primarily intended for a functional programming sort of community so it had a lot of details about using hedgehog a haskell library hands on code examples what kind of problems you run into when actually writing property based tests stuff that people don't talk about uh so uh, and but this is version 2 of the talk right so over here i'll skim over a lot of slides which have uh, core haskell examples because uh, i am assuming no one is interested in uh, haskell over here uh so give a actually uh, let's try that out i always do this in my talks uh, but you know there's audio and visual feedback uh how many people in the room right now know about haskell like thumbs up There, it is. there. No thumbs up. One thumbs up. Right. So I think that's a just two thumbs ups. All right. So yeah. So uh, yeah. That's the thing. This talk is. I've changed my slide now. I'm waiting for the slide to get synced. So um, you know, you can when you're talking about PBT, you can take two angles in into talking about it. The first one is. Uh, you talk about the infrastructure around setting up tests or uh, you know the libraries that you need to use to uh, you uh, run property based tests uh, the kind of problems that you will run into while generating random data things like that right the other thing is once you've set up the infrastructure you have to think of good meaningful properties right so this particular talk is more about the latter which is thinking about meaningful properties this will get into very little details or almost no details about the first half which is the infrastructure around property based testing which library to use how to run parallel tests how to uh, generate random data etc etc because of all my experience over there is with respect to haskell uh, which is for this audience is a uh, pretty irrelevant so let, keeping that in mind um I'll move on to the next slide. These are all from my previous talk. So this is how I got started. John uh, Hughes conference, uh, the functional con talk at 2016, where I first learned about PBT. I was really excited. I went back and uh, I tried implementing it at Vacation Labs and failed miserably. Uh, so the thing about this particular talk, and he's given the same talk multiple times, is it's very, uh, you know, very motivating, very inspirational. but it lacks sufficient detail right so in fact uh, twice in this conference in you know in functional conf i uttered this cheeky quote of mine and i'll do it again like my experience is that only two people know how to use quick check effectively one is john and the other is god right and the more i keep looking at this uh, problem domain i realize that the community is still figuring out how to use pbt uh so if you're struggling as i was that's par for course right uh, we've started this uh, pbt uh, this term itself has started becoming popular over the last couple of years uh, you know and people are still figuring out how to harness it and use it effectively right so let's continue the skimming of slides blah 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 all of this is not relevant all of this is not relevant this is about getting into details about hedgehog the library and here is where we start with the meat of the current talk right so the problem with the other apart from the infra side the other side of the problem of pbt is 
that uh, how do you think about properties? How do you write properties in real life uh, business line of business applications that you know typical web apps, uh, uh, you know user registration systems, blogging systems, e-commerce checkout carts, uh, POS systems, those kind of uh, you know apps that a whole lot of us are writing uh, to you know uh, make a living. Right? Because all the examples uh, that I saw back in 2016, and even today, the today the situation is slightly better. But back in 2016, everything was all about you know the typical. If you reverse a list twice, you should get back the same list. Sure, theoretically it's right, but practically it's useless. Right? The other class of tests which everyone spoke about uh, were round tripping tests. Right? If you have a JSON serializer and deserializer. You take a data structure, you serialize it, and you deserialize it. You should get this data structure, same data structure back. Uh, now, that actually is a very useful test. Uh, I, I'll also talk about it in one of the slides. Uh, but it's limiting. That's not the only thing that you can do with PBT. So we have to move beyond that. So compared to 2016, today the situation is slightly better, but really only slightly. While preparing for this talk, I went to Hackage, which is the Haskell package repository. I looked at all packages that had a reverse dependency on either Hedgehog or Quick Check. These are the two most popular uh, PBT libraries in the Haskell ecosystem. I found a lot of them. A lot of them are trying to do property-based tests. I dug into about 80 or 90 of those um, projects, open source projects. Uh, and almost all of them were using property-based testing in a trivial manner. Either it was... Uh, a round trip test or some extremely small part of the entire program was being tested. So again, reinforcing my thought that yes, PBT is getting popular. It is useful, but figuring it, figuring out how to put it to use is still a challenge, right? So this is the typical, uh, I know, I know this is Haskell code. Please pardon me for that. But uh, the idea over here is the last line. So list dot reverse list dot reverse like you're reversing a randomly generated list twice and you should get back the same original list. Yeah, that's the whole point of this test. That's that's your typical uh, theoretical reverse a list twice sort of an example, which I don't particularly like. So let's move on from here. It's not interesting, right? So how do you think about properties in real life apps? So we'll start with some hand waving examples and then I'll follow that up with uh, some examples from real life code that I have written. So first hand uh, experience. And I'll try to spend more time in, um, you know, how like the thought process that went behind writing those kind of properties. Right. So the first rule for property based tests and to make sure. So, I mean, if you really think hard about it, uh, property based tests and uh, example based tests, you know, example based tests are the kind of tests that uh, most people uh, are used to writing, which is a, a known set of inputs. You apply your uh, functions to it. You set, take those known set of inputs and process it. And one there is a, okay. Uh, you process it through your system and you get an output, but because your input is known, therefore your output is also known. So everything is hard coded in your test. Your assertion, the input that you're feeding into your system is hard coded. The output that you are comparing it against is also hard coded, right? Now, in property based tests, you try to generate random inputs, right? But in real life, you cannot generate completely ran random inputs because in, in any real life business application, there is a known range of inputs uh, within which your application is expected to function, right? So it, it ends up being a grayscale, right? That you know, for example, that list example, which we always use reversal list twice, and it should give you back the same list that can work for any and every list, right? But in all probability, and in my experience, that is not how things work in real life business uh, cases, you would want to generate a set of random inputs, but you would want to apply some minor constraints on it, so that the inputs are meaningful. However, if you constrain your inputs, too much, then you on a grayscale between example based tests and uh, uh, property based tests, 
the more constrained you make your uh, inputs, the more you are moving towards example based tests, right? So your thought process should be that for all inputs X, I need to find a property Y, which should hold true for all inputs X, but there can be some minor constraints on X, depending upon the business scenario uh, in question. You constrain it too much, you start moving towards example based tests. So that's rule number zero, right? So now the first one, let's get this out of the way, round tripping. Uh, the basic, basically, everyone starts off with PBT using round tripping tests. And that is not a bad idea. Round tripping tests are extremely powerful. Specifically, if you are handwriting any sort of uh, codec, JSON codec, CSV codec, uh, you know, uh, writing a, a record from the database uh, to a file, to YAML, right? Uh, once you run that codec through a round tripping test, uh, hang on, uh, I'll just uh, ha I have to ask a thumbs up again. Uh, is this pace correct? I completely assumed that people who are attending this talk have an idea about uh, uh, property based tests. So I have not gotten into the like absolute basic theory of PBT. Is that good enough? I can see four, five, six. Seven thumbs up, eight. All right, so I'll continue with this space. So not going through the basics, but just focusing completely on examples, right? So uh, this is perfect for serialization and deserialization. My own example says is that even if you, you know, something, some codec, some serializer and deserialization function pair, which seems very obvious, the round trip test for it is literally one line, write it you will be surprised by the kind of edge cases that it catches, right? Uh, so for my, uh, we wrote a, a simple round trip test for one of our APIs, uh, like uh, that's the third example, can possibly be used for simple REST APIs. You post to a REST resource, you, so you, you basically you create an in-memory data structure, you convert it to JSON, you post it to your API, and then you call another API to get the same resource back. It will give, give it back to you as JSON. You convert it back into your in-memory data structure and you compare the input in-memory data structure and the final output in-memory data structure. They should be exactly the same, right? This simple test, uh, you know, in our case, we realized that in, uh, in our, somewhere in our uh, API pipeline, there was some library we were using which was not handling Unicode properly. So when you end up generating so much random data throughout your entire input space, right? Simple strings. If you're writing a uh, basic uh, example based test, you would, you know, for a name field, you would use your own name for an email field. You would use, you would use your own email, but you know, uh, in PBT, when you're generating random data, it's going to be all over the place. You will generate valid ASCII. You will generate valid Unicode. You will generate invalid Unicode. Uh, if you, if you don't have a, a round tripping test, you would never spend the time writing these kind of edge cases, but a PBT will do that automatically for you. So even though these tests are very simple to write, literally just one line of code, you will be surprised by the kind of stuff that they can catch for you, right? So some examples, perfect for serialization and deserialization functions. Uh, the third one also we've just spoken about is round tripping across a REST API, right? As much as possible in your REST APIs, you would want uh, your input JSONs and output JSONs to be symmetric that can be tested and uh, validated across refactors and across multiple versions of your app by just one line of code. Uh, the other thing is uh, the Unicode example, which I gave, right? Either you're not, you're somewhere along your text manipulation pipeline, you're not handling Unicode properly uh, either, or you're making assumptions that you would always be working in the English language. And, you know, trying to say something as simple as trying to split something by first name and last name while uh, splitting by space works in uh, English. It might not work for some other language. Conversions to lowercase and uppercase might work from English to English, but they might not work in other languages. Right. So uh, those kind of things can be caught very quickly with simple tripping tests. Uh, moving on now, this is a bunch. I, you, once you start, if you're interested in this problem and you start reading about this, 
uh, a lot of people use these mathematical terms idempot idempotency associativity uh, i have also used those but you know let's let's try to exemplify those right so the idea is that the result should not change if, if the same function is applied multiple time on its inputs right so one example is changing the case of a string repeatedly right you call two upper on a string repeatedly it will give you the it should give you the same results unless there is a bug in your unicode handle right very simple example not very meaningful but i just put it there what about the second one you make a put call to update a rest resource as long as your put update is the same the resultant resource on the server side should be the same right if you if you actually followed a uh, uh, rest recommended best practices right so calling a put with the same payload repeatedly should not change the server side representation of the resource right so it should be id important right third example and uh, you know in we we actually wrote one of these tests and we realized that in our vacation labs code there was a bug in in the way in which sign in was working right so basically otherwise you wouldn't end up thinking of testing these sort of things so a user opens two tabs um both of both of the tabs have the sign in page open he does sign in on one page and then he forgets that he has done a sign in then he opens the other tab the sign in page is already there and he does a sign in again but the next time when the post to slash sign in happens the auth token is already in place are you 100% sure that your current api implementations are handling this edge case properly right a simple idem idem potency uh, pbt can help you catch things like this right so that's one way to think about it right so first one was round tripping look at your problem to pain can you find certain data models certain functions certain apis which should satisfy the round tripping property right can you find same can you find certain processes functions data models apis which should satisfy the idem potency uh, problem once you have the overall infrastructure set up right right setting up the overall infrastructure is a bit of a pain there's a whole lot of boilerplate involved not the topic of this talk but once you've set that up each of these is literally a, a one line test and the value that they deliver is pretty high right uh this is a bit of a variation i don't know the mathematical term for this but uh, this is a bit of a varied variation on the idem potency uh, sort of property uh so you have a transformation you have a data transformation and you have an input you transform the data you get an output now the result set between the input and output should be the same so i've seen this a number of times like most common use case almost every one of us if they are writing web apps we end up writing a search and sort api if you know uh, either it is written on top of a uh, elastic search or it's a wrapper on top of uh, basic sql but there are at least 20 times in a project that you end up writing some sort of a search and sort api search sort and pagination right so uh, without hard coding input examples and output examples one way to verify uh, you know that it's working fine right is you perform the same random search but you sort it by different random fields right so the uh, the search part of the query is the same but the sort is different right the result set not the uh, exact list because the order is different so they will be different but the distinct set the result set should be the same right it seems obvious you would not uh, you would say not very useful test but we've actually caught bugs with such a simple property so uh, in our vacation labs code we had a very complex search and sort api which was joining across multiple tables doing a bunch of um, sub queries and joins inner joins left joins etc etc et et and using a whole lot of aggregations and there was actually a bug that uh, you know the depending upon what field you order you your uh, one of the sub queries had to change and that was not implemented correctly 
right? No amount of manual testing, no amount of example-based testing would have caught that. But this sort of a test caught it. There are more variations of this. Uh, once we get to the uh, sort of deep dive examples, this uh, one of my um, um, longer examples is about a search and sort API. So this is not the only property. There are other properties around search and sort APIs that you can think of. Uh, all right, that slide should have been deleted. Moving on. Uh, the other two uh, sort of uh, tests that people end up writing are associativity and commutativity. In the Haskell space, these are mostly used to verify monad laws or monoid laws. Not very interesting for this particular talk, uh, but here are two interesting examples. So uh, hang on, just quickly. Do, uh, do I need to explain associativity and commutativity, or does everyone just, just understand it? Please thumbs up, please. Okay, just one thumbs up. I think I'll explain it. So essentially associativity in mathematical terms, it means is that the first thing is an, uh, the first A plus bracket of B plus C should be equal to bracket of A plus B plus C. That is actually associativity, which means that if you've got uh, three values and an operation which combines these values, it shouldn't matter in which order you combine them. So if you combine B plus C first, and to that result, combine A, versus if you combine A and B first, and to that result, combine C, you should get the same answer, right? The simplest example for that, that is addition. The second is commutativity, which means that the order of arguments, like if you combine A and B, if you add A and B, or you add B to A, like flipping the order should not matter, right? Now, in terms of business applications, what does this mean? In terms of data structures, I mean, if you're uh, actually sort of handwriting a, um, a sort of a tree or a or, or like a, some esoteric data structure that is required in your problem domain, then yes, you can apply these properties. You can think about very, you can think very mathematically about these properties because then your problem domain is actually the data structure and data structures like your poetry, tries, maps, are, uh, red, uh, red, black balance trees, all of those kind of data structures actually have core mathematical properties that they need to obey. But taking that idea and putting it into a business application, right? Let's look at a hotel booking system, right? Generate a set of random bookings and cancellations. Keep that set constant. You've generated a random set of bookings and cancellations. Now apply that to your system, right? New booking, cancel the previous booking, new booking, whatever. It's, it's a random, the set of bookings and cancellations is same, but they are applied in different orders. At the end, the resulting room availability should be same. Irrespective of the order in which bookings and cancellations are applied, there will be an edge case around cancellations, which means you can't cancel a booking before it is done, but that's an implementation detail. But conceptually, irrespective of the order in which bookings and cancellations are applied, the resulting room availability should be the same. Seems like a very simple property, but in a complex system, we, you know, real life use case, our availability was being cached. This under this uncovered bugs in the caching logic. Right. So it seems like a very simple property, but once you, once you write this property, you sort of realize that this property should hold for all sets of bookings and cancellations and you write it down and you let it run over a large random data set. You will be surprised by the kind of bugs it catches, which you would never think of when uh, doing example based testing. Uh, other, another example, uh, Although I have not used uh, written something of the nature of uh, something of this nature on my own, but follow the same principle. Serialized and so you have you have an algorithm, you have a certain process. You can either run it in a serialized manner; it picks up one data, processes it, picks up the other data, processes it, single threaded serialized. Versus if you write a concurrent implementation for it. If your problem domain is associated or I'm not sure either. I mean, if it follows these properties, 
you should get the same results like the order in which you're processing your input either it's serialized on or concurrent it should be same right so as soon as you realize that you can have two versions and sort of have a simplified version which does the does the does it job serial serially have an optimized version which does its job in a concurrent manner use pbt to test their results against each other right that is possible only if your uh, inputs and outputs uh, obey these laws that right? you can process them out of order but still get the same results right so taking those mathematical ideas associativity and commutativity and seeing how they map to typical business problems moving on uh god i've only 15 minutes left all right uh is can i speed up or is this pace good enough thumbs up okay uh, there was a question <laughs> it was an ill formed question thumbs up for speed up speed up everyone on speed up um right so one more thing is that once you've got the infra in place i tend to do this i basically write a no property test you've got you've written so much of boilerplate so much of infra for generating a uh, random input you let it run on your system and you just observe where your system breaks there's no property you don't assert for anything you know the, the only assertion can probably be that say if you're testing an api it should not throw a 500 error just let it uh, generate random data and let let it hit your api and you see where your system breaks and that can result in a lot of learning and a lot of unexpected sort of bugs that you wouldn't have thought about right you can use this to discover uh, potential sql injection spots spots where you know unicode handling is incorrect unhandled system states things like that right so essentially there is no property over here it's just this piggy backing on top of the testing infra you written so much you've done so much of work to write the infra just use it to run your system across a large input uh, set right the other one is comparing against another system or implementation right so you've got two systems uh, for the same um, system you've got two implementations for example you have a uh, you have a cat you have a pipeline which delivers things from a cache you have a pipeline which delivers things not from the cache but hits the database directly for any input they should return the same results with some constraints probably uh, you do you make some changes and you have to wait for a, a offline job which updates the cache to complete so you let that happen you put that in your test infra but after that precondition is met your cached results and your non cached results should be the same right uh, optimized algorithm should have the same results as brute as brute force and uh, specifically if you are sort of doing uh, if you are migrating legacy systems to new implementations you can use pbt to test results from the new implementation against results from the old one right so i'm speeding up next uh, a special case of that of the previous slide is implement a simplified model of the system under test right so over here both of these might be implementations that are already there in your uh, in, in your code right a cached uh, implementation and a non cached implementation both need to exist right but sorry but in this case you write a simplified implementation only for testing right this is you know if you want to use pbt and you have a complicated stateful systems this is sometimes important it's a lot of hard work to get right based on my personal experience you end up with two implementations of the same system and uh, and when you find bugs sometimes you know the bug is not even in your uh, original system but in on your simplified system right so you you really have to look at the intersection of these systems to find bugs so uh, moving on to the more in depth example we have about 15 minutes i think it should be enough this time i should be able to finish my deck in time so uh, this is uh, the odd jobs library it's a, a database queuing library which we wrote in haskell and tested using property based tests right 
So quick overview of what this looks like. This is the UI. Uh, so this, uh, this is where you can see that you have the ability to uh, search, sort, and filter jobs, right? So this, uh, so the backend for this database is Postgres, right? So it's not Redis, it's not anything. So this search and sort is basically a Haskell API written on top of SQL, right? So very like a very common problem of, uh, across most business apps. So now using PBD to test job filtering, uh, like is is the um, API written on top of uh, simple SQL where clauses to um, Search and sort, is that implemented correctly or not? Uh, I'll skip over this Haskell code. This is from my previous talk. Um, so essentially the reason why it was worth uh, even writing the test for this is that because I was not using any uh, SQL, um, any advanced SQL library, I was using string concatenation to generate raw SQL strings because I wanted to keep the footprint of the dependency footprint of the library low. Uh, Right, so these are all actual problems in up test infrastructure. I'm going to skim over all of them. These are all from previous talk. So uh, now the problem is, uh, like you with normal tests, you have known data. You would, like if I were writing this three years ago, if I had to filter, uh, I would end up uh, uh, writing 20, 30, 50 known rows into the DB making a bunch of known search and sort query calls and then testing it against a known set of good results. So basically example based testing right now. But as soon as you move to PBT, the rows that you're inserting to DB are random. The filter and uh, the, you know, the filter query that you're issuing is also random. What do you compare it against? So this is where you compare it against a simplified model. So in this case, the simplified model was um, Okay, Haskell code again, Haskell alert. So uh, in this case, the simplified model was, uh, you generate a bunch of in-memory, so this is a job queue, right? So this is searching and sorting over jobs. So you generate a bunch of in-memory jobs, you write them to the database, you retain them as a simple list in memory. You generate a filter, a random filter, right? So in, you know, the random filter would look like, I'll just show the data structure. Yeah, a random generate, a random filter on the basis of created after, created before, updated after. So you basically randomly generate values which fit this data structure. You run the same filter via the system, which is it hits the database and gets you the results. And you run the same filter against the simplified implementation. This simplified implementation is doing basic limit offset is done using the simple take and drop functions. So take L elements after dropping O elements, like drop offset elements and take limit elements, right? Uh, filtering by created after is basically, you know, get me all the jobs less than equal to job created. So this is a simplified in memory implementation of the same filtering, you apply the same filter to the in-memory list, you apply the same filter to the jobs you've just stored into the DB and you compare them against each other. But now, essentially with this system under test, you know, the simplified implementation approach, you end up with this problem that you have two implementations to debug, right? And this is where the art lies, right? How simple should be your simplified implementation? How detailed should it be? Things like that. This only comes with practice. There is no one size fits all answer to this, right? So uh, there is the, another example from the same case study, another simplified model to test against. So uh, this one was for, so that was only for the search and sort API, right? Job monitor, the UI needs to have searching and sorting functionality. That was just for that. This was for the core job runners, right? So you have a job monitor, which is monitoring the queue for new jobs. It spawns up multiple threads. Uh, it gives them, uh, you know, these job timeout minutes. So every job gets a timeout. If it doesn't finish within those those many number of minutes, it's assumed to be crashed. It gets requeued again. So there's a whole lot of stateful logic which is going on over here. So the ultimate test that, you know, which was written for this is, gen, uh, 
I'm it's kind of hard to explain Haskell code right now, but anyways, I'll I'll try to basically explain this conceptually. Uh, you generate tons of random jobs, you store them to the DB, and you start running the jobs. So your system is running. But as you're running the jobs, as and when jobs are being picked up, you maintain an in-memory audit log. So you basically use the hooks that the job itself provides. So these are the hooks. So whenever a job is started, you can call a function. Whenever a job is failed, you can call a function. So you use these hooks to maintain an audit log, in-memory audit log, which creates a serialized representation of how of what the job you did. Now, after some time, uh, you stop the job queue and you let it stop gracefully. And then you start running property based tests against the serialized in memory audit log that you've collected and you know, the properties. So here are the, here are the kind of properties that, uh, you know, I came up with first is, uh, this one was added a little later. The very first one, no job should be in a locked state. So this one was added after uh, um, graceful shutdown was implemented. So if you if you have 10 jobs running in memory and you want to shut it down, what the system does is it waits for the jobs to complete execution, right? After a wait time, if they are still running, it uh, kills those jobs, but it it needs to unlock them. So the next so some so that some other thread can run, right? So if that is uh, implemented properly, at the end of this entire process, no job should be in a locked state, right? If graceful shutdown is implemented correctly, irrespective of whether a job was in the middle of running, uh, whatever, 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 locked job count should be zero. Uh, next thing is uh, that, uh, next, next one was uh, that all jobs should have been picked up given a certain condition. So, so when uh, we've uh, given enough time for the job queue to run, given that precondition, every single job should have been attempted at least once. Right. So you can basically look at the audit trail, look at uh, there was a there is a column being maintained for each job, like the number of times it has been attempted. So essentially, that's what it's doing. Then the next thing is no job should have been simultaneously picked up by more than one worker. So this is for ensuring that there are no race conditions, right? Because the SQL, which figures out what job to pick up next, it's a complicated SQL. And as we speak, that SQL is being changed even further to introduce more features, which the community wants. So this sort of simple, like one line test at the end of it all, that after running this entire test, uh, entire system observing its uh, execution in the form of an audit log at no point should a job have been picked up by more than one worker. Uh, this one without the fun the last one without the function um, definition over there CC violated concurrence. So there is another feature over there, wherein uh, you can control how many concurrent jobs can uh, the job runners run. Uh, and that can be dynamically controlled on the basis of your CPU load, on the basis of your memory uh, pressure, on the basis of IOPS pressure. So again, looking at the uh, audit trail, you figure out that at no point the concurrency control should have been violated. Now, these tests are still not perfect. Uh, we are still evolving this. But the amount of stuff that they can catch and the amount of confidence that they that this one test. So uh, in my test suite, if I can sh show, quickly show you. It's not all property based tests, by the way. Is my, uh, is this Git URL? Okay. Let me, uh, the, yeah, all right. So it's not, so if you see, there are these simple tests, these are example based tests. So this is essentially just job should be created, job should be scheduled, failure, blah, blah, blah. Just one, 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 one test. I didn't bother any more than that. Most of the bulk of the uh, quality assurance is being done over here. I just wrote one test called test everything. It goes crazy running jobs, uh, st actually stress tests, stressed tests the system also as a result, and then ensures a bunch of properties on the test results. Uh, all right, moving on. 
I guess just three minutes are left. I don't think I can get into this particular example. But this is not from Haskell, actually. This is from the Rails world. Once I started reading up and doing more on PBT, I started doing all of that learning and putting it back into the Rails world as well. So in this particular example, uh, we have uh, we have a SaaS platform where uh, your uh, there is a metered usage. Uh, a certain part of the platform can be you, it has essentially metered usage, and it depends on a bunch of factors. And those if the, those bunch of factors grow combinatorially. Right. So testing whether the metered usage, the billing code is implemented correctly across all those combinations of all those factors. Uh, earlier, we actually had example based tests and we always ended up uh, hitting corner cases which were not tested. So finally, again, using a test again, simplified model kind of approach and randomizing the entire uh, inputs, we wrote much better tests. Uh, so. Devesh, I'm almost up, right? 4.15, this gets over, right? Yes, yes. All right. First time, first time finishing this off on time. All right. So if you're interested in this sort of, uh, uh, you know, using PBT outside of the mathematical core data structure kind of uh, environment, uh, here's a bunch of stuff that I also read has some interesting ideas. The first one is PBT in a screencast editor. editor. Uh, this particular gentleman, Oscar, you should check out his, uh, this is actually a paid PDF. It's a, that's a lean pub link. Uh, he basically wrote a screencast editor uh, and uh, wrote property based tests for that. His journey is also exactly the same, struggling with PBT, uh, figuring out what are my properties of my system, et cetera, et cetera. It walks you through the entire thought process. So, uh, and uh, a number of times he came up with incorrect properties as well. Towards the end of his project, he realizes that this property itself is incorrect. His understanding of the spec is incorrect. Uh, his other project is even more interesting. It's called Quickstrom. It's using property-based test for testing web-based UIs. It's still very much in a researchy kind of a phase, but it's very interesting, right? Actual real life application of property based testing. If he manages to make it work, it's going to be the amazing case study. Uh, this other talk thinking in properties by Susan Potter. Uh, third link is also a talk. Fourth one is a blog post uh, written by the F sharp world, not world, but similar ideas. That's about it. But thanks Saurabh for sharing your experience with us today. Um, All right.